New though it may seem, Bitcoin is not the first private money whose native habitat is the internet. Furthermore, the patron saint of Bitcoin is not the first to see the need. Rather, Satoshi stood on the shoulders of those who came before, connected the right dots, and added his own innovation to create cryptocurrency as we know it today. But today is not our focus, and I'm joined by Richard Bose, an entrepreneur and marketer who recently wrote about the history, what came before. Richard, thanks for joining me today on Let's Talk Bitcoin. Hi, Adam. Nice to, uh, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. So tell me, in a nutshell, what is the cypherpunk movement? That's a good question. I think it's easiest to start at the beginning um, in 1992 when Tim May and Eric Hughes and John Gilmore started uh, the cypherpunk's mailing list. Uh, a lot of people joined over the next kind of five, six years, and, and they were really interested in bringing strong encryption into the public domain and taking it away from agencies like the NSA out of the hands of government. So that's when it, that's when it really gets going with a kind of label. But now I think uh, with the rise of Bitcoin, it's becoming something else. You know, it's becoming a, a almost a fashion statement. You know, it's becoming this kind of like place where that kids can identify with and understand um, which coders and hackers and business people of all flavors that can, can, can really come together. That's my take on it anyway. Uh, I, I see it as a movement with Satoshi being the kind of mythical figurehead of the whole thing. But yeah, no, it has very deep roots and, and, and clearly a, a lot of extremely intelligent people have put their weight into it in one way or another. So when we talk about a mailing list, we're talking essentially about, uh, and, and you said this was the late 80s? Uh, early 90s, really, 92. Okay, so that we're talking about started. very, very early email. And this is essentially not, ne- not, not even so much a community as it was just people having a group conversation and mailing ideas back and forth on, on these topics, right? Right, exactly. So let me ask, how did you get interested in this topic? Was this, you know, coming to it from, from the Bitcoin perspective and trying to figure out the history of where we came from, or were you, were you interested in it from a different angle? Uh, let me say, the, the first time I really heard of Bitcoin was July last year. And I'd kind of been, been thinking about uh, digital money. My, my father's a programmer, and he had introduced me to the idea that the euro should have been a completely digital currency. And I sort of did some digging when I was a teenager and found out that all the, the, the kind of political implications of having a digital currency that was like non anonymous you know not anonymous that was traceable and so when I, when I was introduced to Bitcoin it, the penny dropped and I think somebody introduced it to me quite simply as cryptographic peer-to-peer anonymous currency or something like that and it just instantly took hold and I was like that's the next big thing I'm going to go down this road absolutely you know straight to it and just dive straight into the rabbit hole. And the first thing that kind of grabbed me was who is Satoshi, right? So I kind of Googled around and uh, tried to dig a little bit and found that he had registered the site, I think it was, is it Bitcoin.org, through anonymous speech, which was being run by a guy who who was in one of the guest houses where I was living in Tokyo at the time. So I was kind of like, oh, Satoshi's more or less on my doorstep. Or when I was in Tokyo, he was more or less on my doorstep. I was I lived there for a couple of years in 2008. It kind of had this this feeling that he was right there, that I'd been within spitting distance, even when I, I didn't really know anything about it. And obviously, those were very early days when nobody knew anything. So that kind of like, I don't know, something about that just really spurred me on. Then I had a, actually a lot of help with the research from a very good security consultant who kind of really, really dug into it. I emailed a few of the a few of the main guys, uh, particularly Adam Back was extremely kind of helpful and, and, and open and friendly and uh, gave me some great leads to look at uh, a bit deeper into, into, you know, who the major characters were. So it sort of came together organically. So Richard, you mentioned strong cryptography as being sort of a, a cornerstone of what the cypherpunks were trying to do. Why mm-hmm. is that something that was important to them at that point in time? Because I don't really think there was the threat of the NSA breaking all communications pervasively. I really, don't, I mean, well, uh, I think early on, I mean, in the seventies, Rivest Shamir and Edelman, right? They they came up with this uh, algorithm uh, which was known as RSA. Stephen Levy describes this this whole story in much detail in his book Crypto, and these guys and um, Marty Hellman and, and and Diffie Whitfield particularly particularly Diffie Whitfield actually had this kind of real 
almost paranoid mistrust of specifically the NSA and, and specifically government agencies who uh, were insisting that uh, strong cryptography was not something for the masses, that it was a threat to national security. And particularly when Diffie Hellman, uh, Marty Hellman and Whitfield Diffie came up with their key exchange, uh, the NSA was terrified and, and kind of you know put a clamp on the whole thing. Um, key exchanges were, it was just a new thing in cryptography, right? Public-private key exchanges. Before that, you only had symmetrical uh, encryption where you both had to have the same passwords to access an encrypted message. Whereas with the, the, the Diffie-Hellman system, you created your public key and your private key and you published your public key and then you could swap your public keys and you could send uh, your encrypted messages to to whomever you had the public key of. And so the NSA kind of freaked out over this because it had, it had been worked out in, you know, deepest, darkest secret in, I think, in the bowels of GCHQ in the 60s. Um, but GCHQ hadn't figured out how to use it. And they hadn't, they, they obviously hadn't published it. I know NSA, but what's GCHQ? GCHQ is the British version of, of NSA. Ah. Uh, I think it stands for General Central Communications Headquarters or something like that. Uh, but it's GCHQ is the British version of, of the NSA. So yeah, they, uh, and there was this kind of moment where the state certainly classed uh, strong encryption algorithms as, uh, as weapons. And so you couldn't export the, 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 encryption, the strong encryption algorithms in your, in your software. And I think Lotus had something called Notes that was that the NSA basically clamped down and said, oh, you can only have 31-bit encryption on, on, on the foreign export version of Notes and things like that. So do you think that the cypherpunk movement was a reaction to that, or was the cypherpunk movement already in process when this started becoming an issue? What's interesting is these guys really saw it coming. I mean, they really saw the whole, uh, even people like Assange, you know, really early on thinking all of these communications are going to get sucked up as they pass from continent to continent by the governments and, and and nothing is going to be private it's all just public stuff so it's not even a question of you know if if they do it it's it's basically when it's like this all, all of this communication is public and therefore strong cryptography should be in the public domain also people have a right to privacy and they really saw that coming 10 20 years uh, ahead so seeing things coming early isn't always that rewarding of an experience. And I know that there have been other attempts at things like cryptocurrencies that were not exactly cryptocurrencies before this. Those arose from the cypherpunk movement as well, right? I think what maybe differentiates cypherpunk as a movement from those other early experiments, or particularly systems like the Liberty Reserve, are the philosophy and the politics behind it, right? So uh, in my mind, at least, as I say, cypherpunk is, is kind of by nature... Its, its goal is to overturn the status quo. You know, by nature, it's disruptive. But also, I think there is this kind of strong philosophical, perhaps even moral backbone to it, which, you know, I have to say things like Liberty Reserve, I'm not so sure that they're backed up in the same way. Or even David Chaum, who was a brilliant uh, cryptographer and, and, the, and, and the creator of DigiCash, he had the sort of the privatization profit motive going on behind DigiCash, which I think ultimately sank it. And what's key about Bitcoin and, and the new technology is the fact that it's so shared, so it's so open source that anybody can get involved. And that's why you have acolytes and evangelists who are just crazy about it, you know, almost religious in their fervor, because it, it has this potential to just kind of open up the economic stage and, 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 and allow people in. Uh, and it doesn't, it's not exclusive in the way that DigiCash was. So I know that you're pretty much a believer too, and most people that are listening to the show will be as well. But I think that that's the main, the, the main differentiation between Bitcoin and its public ledger and its open source um, nature uh, and, and the previous attempts. So what do you think, you know, for people lacking, lacking an understanding of where we've come from, what parts about the cypherpunk movement or specific individuals within it? You mentioned Assange, and I assume you mean Julian Assange. He has an interesting quote, transparency for the powerful and privacy for the weak. And I think that that's a really 
interesting approach because we live in a world that's full of one size fits all solutions. And generally speaking, it's kind of why we have this problem that we do now, because if there are a small number of, of bad actors, then everyone is treated as if they might be a bad actor, which makes it harder, which makes things in general harder for everybody. So we don't have some things that we would accept for this sort of fear. What parts about the cypherpunk movement or individuals within it do you think is important for people to understand who, who aren't familiar with this, who have never heard of it before? I suppose the main thing is this idea that if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to lose. I mean, if, you know, that is the oldest argument in the book, right? And if you've ever read like Kafka, you know, you know it's, it just doesn't work like that. That if you've got bad actors in government, you can be as good as, as anybody. Uh, and they'll still persecute you. So this idea that if you've got had nothing to hide, you've got nothing to lose is, is, you know, it's true up to a point, right? But most people are suspicious of Bitcoin because it protects your, your, your privacy or, or in some ways it protects your privacy, right? You know, people who don't know about cypherpunk are quite likely to kind of say, oh, well, these guys are just disruptive and, you know, they just want, they want anarchy and they want, uh, they want terrorists to be able to communicate and, uh, you know, da, 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 da. But I think really that's not the case. I think the case is we need to find alternatives to, to, to this surveillance state, to the kind of, you know, the control that um, these uh, unknown forces wield over us, right? Like, I mean, we're creative people. And I think we have a right to be creative. Uh, and so that's kind of the main thing that needs to come out of this, is this idea that privacy uh, is a privilege. When it, in fact, you know, really it's a right. You and I should be able to communicate, you know, really whatever we like without being spied on. Um, so that's, that's the key message. In our society, definitely seems like there are people who believe that. But as you mentioned, you know, uh, it's it's really more about the people in government and what they believe. One of the not so nice terms that are used to sometimes dis uh, describe the cypherpunks are, is crypto anarchists, and I'm right. wondering what you think of that term as it relates to this group. Well, uh, I think it's uh, it's kind of fair, but uh, on the other hand, you know, I'm going to hark back to this old thing of the founding fathers being uh, thought of as terrorists at the time. Uh, of the, uh, the establishment of the United States. I mean, I think, you know, you've got this group of people who, you know, a lot, actually quite a large group of people who are founding fathers of the internet. Uh, and, and the same goes for the cypherpunks. I mean, you know, there are, as you say in your introduction, you know, Satoshi was standing on, on, on the shoulders of giants. I mean, people who, who really had far-reaching ideas and who in some senses, I think, are anarchists. Let's talk about that. Uh, let's talk about that term, anarchists, because mm -hmm. anarchists is one of those words that, in modern parlance, has sort of different associations than I think that people who proudly refer. There are some people who proudly refer to themselves as crypto anarchists. I don't right, really right. feel like they, they, their, their interpretation of that word is that there's someone going around lobbing digital bombs. You know, as might be the assumption based on how how they're treated in the media sometimes. What defines a crypto anarchist in this context? I couldn't tell you whether the cypherpunks are crypto anarchists, whether they want to lob digital bombs or, or anything like that. As I say, I guess each member uh, has their own philosophy. I also think that gentleness and, and, and compassion and, and, and uh, mindfulness uh, is the way forward in creating a global culture, right? So we are on, on, on the verge of having this incredibly powerful technology. And I've heard a lot of people, uh, adopters of Bitcoin talk about, you know, billion, it's not cool to be a billionaire anymore, right? It's now it's cool to be a trillionaire kind of thing. And that may be so, but what we really need to do is, is kind of figure out ways that we can make a better world, right? Because we've got this incredible uh, mechanism for energy exchange with very, very low transaction fees. So we can send great amounts of energy and as uh, Vitalik Buterin says in his uh, recent article in Bitcoin magazine, the main thing to do is figure out ways of distributing tasks, distribu doing distributed computing, and not necessarily in the way of SETI or folding at home, but in the way, uh, in, in Bitcoin's own particular way. It, it will give rise to new uh, social architectures and hopefully uh, new medical advances and things like that. But I think we really have to think carefully about how we want to use this power. You know, it's the old Spider-Man thing of with great power comes great responsibility. We need to, we need to embrace that. That's my two cents anyway. And I would, I would actually, having had some con connection with 
what I would term real crypto anarchists and having seen the kind of raw disregard for law or the or, 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 or raw desire to tear down the old uh, institutions I kind of you know, I'm more moderate than that. You know, I'm, I'm happy to see banks disintermediated to a certain extent and credit card companies, uh, you know, to take some of their power away from them and, and, and downsize them. But like, I'm not personally in favor of just tearing down the old society, uh, you know, willy nilly, like uh, without care. I think we do need to really apply our, our, ourselves to how to recreate the economy and how to get, get people standards of living up and to look at, I don't know, uh, the developing countries and, and see how we can apply Bitcoin there. So there's uh, there's so much work to be done, actually. I think crypto anarchy is a little bit of a distraction. But <laughs> okay, I, I can see that. So, <laughs> so is it an inherent dislike of rules or is it a dislike of the current system that you think leads people who are thinking like you, like you were just describing, to not want to not be interested in the current system. Is it is it is it any system? Is it just that there is a system that's a problem, or is it just that they don't like the current system and so they don't respect it? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, look, I, I think there is, there's probably a difference between punks and anarchists in the sense that punks are kind of just a bit naughty and anarchists are quite serious, you know, about tearing down the system. Now there may be a spectrum, right? Uh, and sometimes uh, they might get a little bit row too rowdy, too serious. I, I wouldn't want to judge either way. You know, if people are really, really being given a hard time by the system and they want, they need to take their anger out on the system and they want to destroy it and they want to use Bitcoin to do it. Well, you know, that's just a, a fact of life. That's going to be a reality, right? I think the problem with the system at the moment, really, and I don't want to speak be too general, but like there's a lot of friction in the global economic system, right? And there's a huge imbalance. So we really need to kind of focus on taking the friction out of the legacy system and using Bitcoin almost as a lubricant, right? Kind of digital snake oil, if you like, but digital lubricant to get the economy going again and also to redistribute so that people can work at home uh, in a way that makes sense for them, you know, so that... Uh, you can outsource easily to digital tasks to people the other side of the world, or you can get paid for your work in an increasingly multinational, multilingual environment without too much hassle, without giving too much money to the credit card companies, right? <laughs> so, all the banks. Richard, is there anything that, um, that I haven't asked about that you'd like to go over? You know, a lot of the, the technical stuff in my article uh, is, is fascinating, and it runs very deep. Uh, and I kind of feel like I've only just got the outline of, of how, how deep it really goes. One of the, the most interesting things for me is, I suppose, this thing that Satoshi said before he disappeared, which was, let's not focus too much on the mysterious creator thing. And I think that's, that's, that's right in a sense. I'm also very interested in the idea that Bitcoin is a kind of intelligence all of its own a sort of disembodied corporation if you like <laughs> that i know that doesn't actually make sense but uh, a, a disembodied intelligence maybe in terms of the, the the technical stuff that's really where it's at and really looking into how it can be applied another thing i would just say is if, if you're really interested in digital property rights and stuff like that read nick sabo's stuff because he is fantastic i mean he's just so interesting and so deep and so academic and as I say in the article, like he was sort of in the habit of going through uh, what uh, what technology there was and, and kind of contextualizing it in historical terms. And, um, and, and so I think he's, he's a great introduction to the subject uh, and hopefully also kind of a bit of a visionary about where it should go or where the technology is going. But also, I mean, there have been so many great technical innovations, you know, real hard co hardcore coders going going into it. Uh, where do you start? <laughs> well, the place to start in this case is letstalkbitcoin.com slash punk, if you want to be directed okay. to Richard's article. <laughs> and uh, Richard, thanks for joining us to talk about the cypherpunk movement. Uh, we look forward to having you back on the show soon. Great. Thanks very much, Adam. Thanks for having me.
Hi, this is Jason King, founder at Sean's Outpost, and you are listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin. Sean's Outpost is a homeless outreach in Pensacola, Florida, and we are proudly powered by Bitcoin. To date, over 13,000 meals have been fed to the homeless in our area, all purchased with Bitcoin and through the generosity of the cryptocurrency community. Read more about us at S-E-A-N-S outpost.com. Food, shelter, Bitcoin, everybody. Sean's outpost.com. 